welcome to the first Narayan webinar, uh, which is today on food that reconnects invisible but essential ingredients for sustainable and healthy food systems. So maybe you're wondering, what is Narayan? Narayan is a little initiative uh, which I started a couple of years ago, which aims to promote a soulful approach to sustainable development. Now, why that, you may wonder. Um, I personally worked about 20 years in, in uh, international cooperation, humanitarian aid, and working primarily on, on food systems and nutrition, including 12 years with the FAO, and I see a lot of FAO colleagues here today, so thank you. Um, and I was working a lot on, on nutrition agriculture linkages. But on the side, I also discovered in depth the science of yoga and meditation, and it really transformed the way I could do my work and or the way I saw things, that I could manage challenges. And, um, and I realized that there's this in invisible dimension to the work we do, um, and particularly in the things that we care about or, or what inspires us, where we find inspiration, support, and yet we don't talk about it. Uh, it's often the most important thing uh, that helps us do our work and, and, and drives us to do it. After all, we work better when we work with joy. Um, and, and so I thought, let's, let's put this topic on the table. And this is the idea of these webinars to talk about these subjects that are mean a lot to us and that yet we don't, we don't talk about. Um, so welcome. Uh, I'm very pleased today. So welcome. So yes, this is the first webinar and I hope it's definitely not the last. And I'm very, of course, we started with food because that's where a lot of us come from. And food is one aspect of our lives that connects us in so many ways to ourselves, to each other, to the environment. And I'm extremely happy to introduce our three speakers for today. Um, so Anna. Anna Hernandez Bonilla will uh, start us off and Anna and I met in university in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. We're both nutritionists. Anna then went on to work many, many years in uh, the International Committee for the Red Cross. She was on all the major crises doing amazing work uh, all over the world and last post in South Sudan and then turned more to the arts world in Stockholm, is now in in Geneva working with the World Health Organization and she'll tell us, well actually I won't tell you because she's going to present something special which is impossible to introduce in a few words. Paul uh, has been working for many many years, 55 years with uh, UNICEF, USAID, the Peace Corps, also NGOs, all sorts of organizations in many countries all over the world. He's been a proponent of VAC nutrition linkages way before it was on the political agenda. And I discovered that he is also very much into mindfulness meditation, and he will be sharing how that has accompanied him through his career uh, in this field of work. And Dr. Ramakant, we met just a few weeks ago. He will be telling us of the miracles that can happen uh, when a community joins hands and brings not only their hands and their knowledge of agriculture and forestry. Dr. Ramakant is a was a, was a forestry officer in the Indian Forest Service before joining the Heartfulness community in Hyderabad. And he will tell us of how they've transformed land, um, yeah, with the hands, with the head, but also with a heart. So with no further ado, I will invite Anna to launch us. And we have an agreement with all four of us that I will be timekeeping. So if I'm not being rude when I tell them they have two minutes left, it's part of our agreement. Um, and so, Anna, please welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I, I will bring you to the um, presentation um, already. So here I go. Can you see it? Yeah? Yes. 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 Okay. yes we can. And my voice is there with you also? Yes, it's there very well. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte, Charlotte and team, for bringing this very wonderful uh, topic on the table. It's uh, a universal, vital, and beautiful topic that uh, uh, is relevant to all, all the times, everywhere, uh, and maybe nowadays more than ever. Uh, I think that through the lenses of, uh, of food, uh, nutrition, um, we may be able to see really clearly uh, or reconfirm uh, uh, that we all 
microscopic and giant uh, beings are so much connected, are actually not only connected, we are really part of a, of a big something. We are intertwined uh, in, in a system. And it's, it, this somehow has such a, a beautiful, uh, uh, it's a beautiful realization, an amazing realization, actually. Um, first, I wish to invite you all um, to have a collective moment of uh, mindfulness. Uh, um, uh, let's call it, if you wish, uh, foodfulness, uh, if you wish. And uh, maybe we can close our eyes and, and for a minute, just to try to recall our fondest memories, uh, the fondest memories we have to, uh, with regards to food. It, it can relate uh, to, to yourself, to others, to, to the environment, to the planet, uh, and just let any thought that it spontaneously come to you uh, to, to invade you and let's cherish this, uh, this moment. We will have one minute to do that. Maybe we come back and uh, maybe, um, maybe some of us were not able really to, to bring fond memories at this time. Maybe because we have uh, more pressing and urgent uh, thoughts or maybe the thoughts were not so fond or so beautiful uh, because maybe we're worrying. We're worrying about uh, how um, all the things that are happening around uh, uh, in the world. And this is precisely the reason why I think uh, that this topic, the topic of food that reconnects, uh, it comes so timely uh, at this very present uh, moment. And I wanted to share with you the, the very reasons, the many reasons why, uh, why I'm thinking that is the case. Starting with Anna, the speculation, yeah? Would you like to put full screen? Okay, um, your, your, your slide? I wanted to have the, the Yes, can okay, you see it now? Okay, oh, yeah. that's perfect. Yeah, perfect. So basically, uh, exp speculation, uh, I, I, I guess you, you see how um, together with the famous, infamous uh, a virus, I will not say the name, uh, it's, it's so much uh, said uh, on, a, on a daily, if not second basis, uh, there are concerns and speculations uh, uh, around the globe uh, uh, that linked, uh, that are very much related to, to food and other necessities. And may, many are not only wondering, uh, but are worrying. And also we are going back to some very behavioral, uh, very instinctive behaviors. We are, um, we are hoarding food at times. And we are worrying about not falling into a scarcity and uh, um, not, not falling into hunger, in, a, in, in hunger. The other element is about uh, being well nourished. Uh, being well nourished plays a vital role uh, with regards to vulnerability, uh, to disease and mortality. And where, wait, oh, I mean, I don't need to, we don't need to, to maybe to, we can discuss this further about the importance of uh, being well, nour uh, well nourished uh, um, and the likelihood of having our immunological capacity, not only to prevent, uh, pre but also recover from diseases. 
So food nutrition is are very, very uh, central at this at this very moment. Conversations. Food is this colorful element. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of conversation that's taking place around the table. In my garden, I often can see for the first time families sharing dinners, laughing at times, arranging themselves to this very unusual way of living life. Um, and I see uh, some neighbors I have never seen before buying food for seniors or other people that prefer not going uh, themselves to the shops or feel ill. So life uh, it seems to me more lively uh, than ever. And in my lead, as I mentioned, my little uh, nuclear family, we feel more vividly connected and we cherish these three moments that we share uh, uh, the, the meals uh, finally together. I think we are also in moments uh, that creativity is uh, awakening uh, the, the, the creativity is awaking in the way we're purchasing our food, we're cooking. Uh, we are also um, uh, bringing some of the narratives of uh, our, our maybe the elders. We are uh, taking some of these old recipes, old ways of doing things uh, uh, into, the, into our cooking. Um, maybe a way of learning. Uh, we worry about not going to school, but maybe I, I have so many friends telling me about how they are baking their own bread and making their own pasta from scratch. So I celebrate all the creativity that this period is, uh, is bringing to us and um, also uh, not only in our households, but also the markets that are already exploring very interesting ways to bring in food uh, to, our, uh, to our tables. So I just uh, wish maybe that along this, this session, we keep uh, just maybe putting some ideas uh, in a post-it on our, our papers, uh, on, on our notebooks, and maybe at the end of the, se of the, of the session, we can create a, collect a collective um, a, a collective collage of ideas of progress and ideas that we bring, we bring, uh, we wish to bring to our ho homes or to our communities uh, in this uh, and this uh, very uh, interesting period we're living. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, and and thank you for bringing this idea of the collage of ideas or photos. I mean, these can be maybe memories or thoughts you want to type into the chat. Uh, it can also be things you can send me my email. I think you all have my emails, but I'll, I'll put it again in the chat for everyone. But I, I really like that idea that we could, um, yeah, if there's anything you want to share, a memory of the food that, you know, came when uh, Anna guided us or a photo of a meal you're cooking with your family in these special times or something you've never baked before or, mm -hmm. and we could post it. I could do a page on that Ayan website as a, as an inspiration for others in these times. Lovely. So we'll now go to Paul. I'll take all three presentations and then we can open up for discussion and sharing. Paul, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Charlotte, and hello, everyone. I'm going to share a little story with you to illustrate how <clears throat> I apply mindfulness in my professional life. Uh, it's an example from a series I've developed called Hiding in Plain Sight. I recently worked in a country in uh, Sub-Sahara Africa that's addressing the issue of micronutrient malnutrition by promoting kitchen or keyhole uh, gardens. Um, they use an outreach uh, strategy of one size fits all for the whole nation. The promoters, both male and female government staff and uh, NGOs, uh, they had a few government approved uniform plot structures for households to choose from. And they also had a list of approved vegetable seeds that could be planted in the home lot. So very prescriptive. So while empowerment of uh, women was also an aim of the garden initiative, it seemed to me the implementation strategy did not take into consideration that households may, they actually were, already growing crops in their home lot. Hmm. Using this prescriptive garden strategy, there was an implied assumption that women who manage the home lot garden and prepare the daily meals did not know what they were doing when it came to food for the family. So this is where mindfulness kicked in my ability to stay in the moment, using mindful breathing to go inside and 
calm my mind that was whirling around when I was seeing these uh, gardens and all the noise that usually goes on, as you know, when you're visiting a community. And working inward in order to tune out, as I say, all the noise of happy talk and success stories uh, to see what was really going on. And, and that was to really discover an invisible garden hiding in plain sight. And that is exactly what happened. So while touring the gardens of households identified by the official uh, participants in the government out, uh, with the government outreach staff, uh, a garden off to the side caught my eye that did not seem to meet the prescriptive garden plot criteria but nevertheless had an impressive variety of micronutrient rich crops growing. I was told she wasn't part of the project. As we all know, that's a code word for don't visit her. She's not part of this project. Well, I said, let's stroll over anyway. And she greeted us and invited us to walk through her small garden that was hugging the four walls of her home. Well, I counted 12 different types of micronutrient dense fruits and vegetables growing in a wonderful mixed cropping structure. The gardener could tell me in detail about her year round garden, how she used each crop in the family's daily meals, and how each crop fit into her household food system. She knew that when she <coughs> nourished the earth, it would respond by nourishing her family. She was not a participant in this national garden project. She needed no funds from an agency to grow crops in the garden and never attended a single nutrition course, according to her. So the government staffers were truly confused by what was transpiring. This lady was not part of the project, had received no technical crop training, no nutrition education classes, no free garden inputs, and yet was meeting the aim of addressing micronutrient malnutrition in the National Kitchen Garden Project all on her own. To me, there was nothing confusing about this. This serene person who was listening to the earth and truly seeing the landscape and its soils guided her as to where to plant, what to plant, and when to plant. By the way, this single encounter resulted in changes to the government's national home garden guidelines. So since starting this work in the mid 1970s, I've learned that most of this work is listening. <laughs> it's just listening to our clients, to households, and observing what they and their neighbors are already doing, and then determine if there are options to make incremental changes to their existing food system structure and functions, such as improving crop yields, maybe some diversity, this type of thing. So really, in, in sum, to me, mindfulness, especially mindful breathing in my case, helps me helps put me really in the right frame of mind to do this work, to be open-minded, not closed-minded. Mindful breathing throughout the day puts me in a mood of acceptance, of really seeing and really listening. Mindful breathing creates a mood in me of patience, true understanding and compassion. Okay, well, I hope this little story has sown a few seeds of inspiration. And with that, Charlotte, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Paul. That's, that's really beautiful. It, it brought me back to Afghanistan a few, uh, many yeah. years ago, where we started a, a home um, school garden project. And in one town in Herat, the school director, we'd given just a few seeds of you know, like three, four plants, and he'd done a beautiful project project with all sorts of varieties and teachers from other schools were coming and and I looked at him and I said but you're doing so much by yourself you didn't need our help to do this why yeah. I, I said so why didn't you do it before and he laughed and he said I think I just needed the encouragement <laughs> and I thought, just, I was just that. It goes a long way. Yeah, it 
then it went, you know, it was self-replicating. We gave so little and it's self-replicated in the country. There are hundreds. People look and learn, they see what he's doing and then they say, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Paul. You're and welcome. now, Dr. Ramakant, we're all ears to hear your story of how a community has actually been doing what this lady from Africa was doing herself. Please, the floor is yours. Namaste. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. <laughs> when I say, when we say Namaste, it means that me and you are one and the same, the sparks of the same divinity, and so I salute the divinity in you. So, with a sense of uh, joy, utmost humility, and also a lingering sense of wonder, I share with you all, uh, 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 you know, a mind-boggling, successful enterprise we had in a very semi-arid uh, landscape. Uh, sorry, sorry for this. Yes, it's coming. <laughs> yeah. A Khana Shantivanam, a spiritual center in the outskirts of Hyderabad city, Telangana in India. We, uh, we undertook uh, greening. Yeah, about uh, five years ago, 1,600 uh, acres of barren lands, temperature shoots up to 48 degrees. The land was infertile and porous. And then this kind of a land, we thought of uh, making a very unrealistic project of greening, wherein aesthetics was the last priority. Wherever I go, you know, people talk about, you know, creating beauty out of plants and things like that. We wanted to create food forests, millet gardens, vegetable gardens, edible wild plants, uh, medicinal gardens and things like that with the, the food for us. Food was very important when we created this you know, gardening, the greening effort. Annam Bhammeti Vijijnyasava. Latin, Latin and Greek for you, <laughs> but it, it means food is the first manifestation of God. So we wanted to create food for ourselves, food for the bees, food for the butterflies, a plenty of it. And then we wanted to do it with indigenous plant species, predominantly indigenous plant species. Another unique part of this uh, greening effort is that people from almost around 165 countries came here and contributed in different ways. Are ecologically very important and conservationally also very important. I'll just go through a few slides of you know, this community effort in greening this landscape. That's how it was, and this is how it is becoming. In the neighboring state, because of drought, large number of coconut trees were about to be you know, discarded, felled and turned into fuel wood. We got them all uh, here and uh, planted a large number of thousands. In the thousands, we planted it here, and then they are doing very well. You know, this is called Kalparuksha. This coconut is called a Kalparuksha, believe that it, it is wish-fulfilling tree. We have plenty of them here. This is how it looks now, this place. And to top it all, we have many rainforests here. The Daji, the spiritual guide, told me we should have rainforests here. I, I smiled from here to here and said, sir, sir, they don't survive here. He let go of that, calls me again after a week and says, I want tall trees, rainforest. 
I said, uh, these plants are evolved to grow in dark, damp places in the blazing hot Hyderabad. Uh, so I have not possible. He calls me again and says, I want rain for us here. What do you do? <laughs> I got a quantity of rainforest species and not knowing that they survive, we planted it and then without glass houses, no glass, no cement, no concrete, no structures, no computers, we have wonderful rainforest emerging. What is a rainforest? You know, if you fly from the air, you know, right, if you look down, 100 feet of canopy and then 100 feet tall tree and then one here, one other, someone, something like this. You know, 150 feet they grow and then multi-layered forests and then we simulated a rainforest and they are doing very well, exceptionally well. Uh, one of my colleagues said, who had lots of respect for me, but he said, what are you doing? They all will die. And there they die. 50% will die, 80% will die. Not a species has died. <laughs> yeah, how is that possible? We didn't have a clue. We didn't have uh, a case study to learn from. But uh, meditative practices makes us intuitive. Somehow, the Bachi and then we as a team, we could feel the need for these need of these plants. We did many things. It's not just uh, uh, science, but then there is something more to it. I mean, this I feel day in and day out. When I go with a, something to prune, I, I hold the plant and I take a leaf and I say, it is not to hurt you. It will do you good. No, please. And then I chop that and they seem to be in my, I come from a dense jungle area in the heart of Western Ghats where tigers, tigers roam just about six kilometers from my home, even today. And uh, I, 32 years of forestry, I have not seen this kind of a incremental growth that I, that we witness here. Their plants respond to our love. Maybe I find very irrational, you may find, but this is what my heart said. The founding father of this institution, the Heartful Institution said, life hinges on, you know, life depends on food and health hinges on nutrition. He had something very different to say. He said the ancient rishis, the saints, they all, they were, they, they gave undue importance to ritualistic path and then vegetarian diet. Laughingly, he said, if they were to be born in Siberia, they wouldn't have recommended everyday bath and then vegetarian diet. However, he said, if you are keen about an elevation within, a journey within, elevation of consciousness, want to experience the joy of your soul, a vegetarian diet, <laughs> goes a long way. It helps. It helps a great deal. He said, we see this, the physical body. There is a soul, roof, atman, whatever you call it. And then in between, subtle bodies, innumerable, broadly, you know, categorized as manas, chitta, buddhi, ahamka, mind, intellect, consciousness, and ego. Thank you. <laughs> Someone says two minutes. <laughs> okay. So in a rock, they are all complete. These three bodies locked very much. In a plant, a little free. In animals, quite free. And in us, almost total freedom, these, three, these four subtle bodies. When you partake animal protein, a part of the Mm, such the bodies of the animals gets into art. This thing may not be very conducive for spiritual elevation is what, uh, what we believe in, no, not an imposition. Basically, meditate. We, the guide uses yogic transmission. When we meditate, something mysteriously we change. Even if I'm very fond of non-vegetarian over a period of time, 
know, what is good comes, what is not very good somehow leave our system. Some unique perspectives uh, that he has. He says, one thing is, of course, God is not for sale, so the meditation practices are free. And those who practice meditation here in this Kana Shantivanam, a lack of people can be fed within the two hours of notice and it comes free. But more importantly, he says, you know, we talk about food and well-being. He says, plants help us in our effort of elevating our consciousness. They absorb yogic energy, essence, and like many of us, they retain it and slowly, gradually re-releases back into the atmosphere, thereby help us in our effort of elevating our consciousness. Comes out with a very nice, so each one to teeth one to plant one. And then the last part of it is, I would like to say, the one who eats without sharing food with others becomes the partaker of sin alone. <laughs> you know, they say, Om Sahana Bhavat, Sahana Bhunat, Sahaviryam Karavavahe, Tejasvina Vajitama, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Let there be peace, let there be peace. Let there not be animosity amongst us. Let's all, may the radiance of Brahman, the ultimate principle, comes to us all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramakanta. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, oh no, this is very encouraging. And I think we're actually seeing this with some of the um, responses of nature to our confinement, that when you give nature space and attention and love, as you said, it can, it's amazing how it can uh, flourish as we saw in the land in Hyderabad. And actually we're seeing also in Europe, for example, in Venice, I don't know if you've seen how fast the waters have cleared, uh, how fast the air is clear clearing. And it's, so nature seems to have amazing recovery capacities. Um, and, and I think we, part of that, our mindfulness maybe is to open up to that, that magic that is there and we seem to not see. So thank you all three of, of you for having uh, shared these really beautiful insights. Um, and now I'd like to suggest that we, you know, we open the floor to your own experiences or your questions or inspirations, anything you'd like to share or ask one of the presenters, anybody. Anna? I no, I wanted to suggest uh, maybe if anybody wants to share the thoughts that came to their minds in this uh, goodfulness uh, moment. Um, That's maybe, also possible. Yeah, I don't know if anybody had uh, the opportunity. It's, it's such a little moment, one minute, uh, but maybe something interesting came up. Anybody who wants to share? This is Myra. It did for me. I didn't see my hand, hang, my hand raised quickly, so I'm just jumping in. Um, you know, we have a, a service here in the States and where I am in, in the East Coast called Hungry Harvest. And it's a service that recovers food that otherwise doesn't make it to market. You know, um, in most of the supermarkets, they want perfect looking fruit and perfect looking avocados and all those things. And this service makes sure uh, that ensures that none of this food is lost. Mm -hmm. And it had been six months since I'd had a delivery. And this seemed a good time to restart it again. And it's so much fun to receive in any shape it comes, you know, uh, this nutrition in a box, it, it, these fresh fruits and vegetables, and that came right to mind, the bounty of food. And of course, what happens is you start thinking of all the wonderful things you can cook with and, sh and how you can share it because you get so much more than you can use. So it's been really wonderful to be back in that place again, of, you know, receiving uh, that fresh bounty. Thank you. Thank you, Myra. And Ami, you had your hand up. Yes, Charlotte, for me, I have been inspired. It's been 
I wasn't expecting this session to be what it is. It is such an inspiring because in Sierra Leone, I'm working with a microbiologist and she's trying to get back to, so that we can try to get the fruits and vegetable trees that have been extinct in the country. Growing up, we had so many fruits, but now you don't see them. So she, we had a meeting, we even sent the concept to the to Irish Aid and spoke with FAO. How can we get the trees that are near extinction back? And how can we get the school kids involved in planting trees? For us, you remember in Sierra Leone, we had the mud slides. People are cutting down trees, they are not planting. So I am really inspired and I'm happy that I join in today. And also learned that life depends on food and health depends on nutrition. I never ever saw it that way. So this is good. And I know that the next webinar, my friend and I will join because mm -hmm. when, when the um, presentation is made available, I'm going to make sure I share it with her because this is something we're actually working on now and looking for support to see how we can do this involving women in the communities, which will also help to empower them, improve their economic status and help the nutritional status of them. So I'm happy I joined them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ami. It makes very beautiful. Thank you so much. Anna. Can I, can I ask you, do you see this period uh, as an opportunity to awake that? Because maybe, uh, I don't know what are the physical distances that are being applied now in uh, Sierra Leone, uh, but this is giving opportunity, especially because you, have, you live in extended family. So this gives the opportunity to, to the elderly, the, sen the senior members of the family being uh, far more interactive because there is a lot of interaction already taking place, but the, it is more um, a more physical uh, a closeness that will maybe allow to, 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 to propose that this is, is, a, is a moment to, to, with this project to take off uh, more, more seriously and more vividly. I don't know if you have uh, contemplated that possibility. Yes, it is because we do need them. We need to go back and talk to them. They need to pass on their knowledge down to us. I see that as what is going to happen. It's going to bring us together, bridge mm. the gap with us. So it's, mm. it's, it's, it's indeed a very good thing that this is happening. And we're all thinking on the same line, regardless of where we are, because we're also thinking and it's inspiring to see the barren land and now it becomes all this greenery. So yeah. it, it's really inspiring. You have to, now I'm kind of really pumped up. I've seen it happen and I know as well to be successful. So yes, it is a very good timing for all of this. Maybe a suggestion, Charlotte, sorry, could be that in, in the next seminar that the maybe if we know about the similar uh, initiatives taking place around in the world, I just came back from Cape Town where I, I heard about it as initiative exactly with these uh, ideas and wanting to learn also from, from, from within the region. Maybe it's, yeah. a, it's a topic to, to bring uh, later. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. I'm actually quite tempted. I have this function on the, on the webinar to break you out into small groups of four for about six minutes or seven minutes because we're 26. And I'm sure each one of you has a little magic story or magic thought to share. So I just like to do that for about, you know, a few minutes um, that you can all share, for example, what came in that moment of foodfulness. Um, and then we can come back into a plenary and have a little bit more of a harvest of those, of those thoughts or, or really inspiring inspirations. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me see if we, uh, okay, I will break the 25 or I'm going to do, okay, I'm going to break into six breakout rooms. So you should basically be automatically assigned to a breakout room. It should work, I think, well, <laughs> I've been okay. one, two, three, see you back in about six minutes. Mm -hmm. now. Mm. Cool. So that was our breakout room experience. So I'm curious to hear now raise your hands and say if there's anything more you want to share in a bigger group. 
Any, yeah, any insights? What came out of your conversation? I'm curious because I wasn't in any of them. <laughs> Well, Florence was off to a wonderful uh, conversation, um, uh, obviously. And we, as we were coming out of breakout, it was, we missed, I missed those last juicy bits, but thank you for the breakout. I, I'll listen in on the plenary. <laughs> Florence, do you want to share what you were saying in your group then? Ah, and then Dr. Lamacan. Florence keeps saying she's going to shut up and just listen. And as you know, it's very <laughs> that doesn't work. Please <laughs> do. We need you. We need you to speak out. <laughs> so, so that I think that the things were. I, I. It was lovely to meet Myra, and I wish I had heard more of the other person in that group. Um, but I think well, one of the things, at least, what I'm getting, and Myra may see, see things very. Uh, you know, I may have uh, bias to what I come out for the discussion was the important when we're talking about food systems to think in terms of bioregions that are often cross-border. And we had very interesting, we were starting to discuss metrics because Myra was interested in, uh, in earth metrics. And for me, as you well know, Charlotte, my concern has always been that we need uh, local metrics um, and that are not a subset of national metrics or of global metrics, but they are something that needs to be developed by the people in that area according to their needs so that they can monitor what is happening in their area. Um, what we I was also saying when we got out of the breakout groups is if we want people to start discussing in particular at local level and a cross-border level, we probably need to forget a lot of the jargon we are used to use, and we should try and calm the priorities to come up with a common language and a common understanding, um, and probably avoid getting more and more new terms coming in because that generates more confusion. Myra, please correct me. You said it all very well. It does remind me that when I was working on the open uh, group for the sustainable development goals, this was where we broke it down, is uh, we failed to really be able to work on the indicators in a, in a really useful way. We had to really turn it over to the statisticians knowing that the statisticians uh, were also going to struggle. And we, we, we understood that the real metrics would have to come from local uh, during implementation, which happens at local levels, that people would need to locally determine what's relevant. We knew that. And it doesn't often get discussed now, but that was a part of our deliberations. When I teach bringing the SDGs as a framework and a map, I want to know in each community, each organization, because I take this information to local grassroots organizations, how important it is for them to determine their indicators and this is important we didn't get a chance i didn't get a chance to add that to the discussion florence but i'm with you maybe that could be a topic of a future on webinar on, on the but actually charlotte, yeah actually charlotte has been working on participatory planning at local level and that was a whole part of the exercise because mm -hmm. when you start getting people around the table trying to get a consensus on the vision of which are the constraints and opportunities in their area, then you, the next step is, well, how are we going to assess that and monitor the evolution? And then you get in all the indicators and monitoring and evaluation process. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Ramakanta, you had your hand up yeah, before. I just wanted to introduce uh, Anne Kier from Austria. She takes Hello. care of the composting part of it. Anything you want to ask, I will be happy to talk about. Ah, oh, that's actually. Yes, you can say something. Yes, uh, please. Ramakanta just said he he spoke about the uh, uh, well he said transmission also, but let's say the divine love that influences has a big influence on the growth of, of anything, also of the making compost. My experience already in this first half year that I'm here. Uh, is that the compost, even though the, the circumstances are far from ideal, it's happening, <laughs> it's happening. 
Yeah. And I think that's wonderful. We really should be very grateful for even compost, even something that is so down to earth, <laughs> because it is, yeah? Well, yeah. That, that that reacts to that so well. Yeah. And there's something magical in the composting of embodying that cycle of life know that everything can be retransformed into re like there is no waste and that uh, this constant cycle of creation wonderful i see it's already five i had put um, a calendar invite for an hour 15 but i know everybody's very busy um and i know this is also a topic that can be continued on for a long time um so if if is there anybody who would like to add a last burning comment before before we conclude um, um and, yep. hi i i could just okay. uh i could just summarize a little bit because i think we had really inspiring in in terms of uh the current situation with uh, people maybe not being able to to be so close to each other we had some um, some uh, well a summary is that that there are some some things that you can do to connect through food anyways and uh, Anna had a good story about having a coffee over over Skype or or, or some video tool uh, with her parents and and other things where when you're working from home you can still connect with your colleagues via sharing recipes for lunch since you're not seeing each other for lunch those days so so that, I think that was very inspiring and, and starting to mm -hmm. plant some food and stuff too. So I think that's uh, that's just some a little comment of our 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 conversation. Thank you. Thank Charlotte, you. yeah, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. One other thing that's starting uh, to happen a bit all over the place. Most of us that are living in areas affected by coronavirus and the different measures, is that we are starting to try and keep our eyes and ears open to see what is changing in food systems in our areas. And there's a lot of people, the, the normal way of working doesn't work any longer, but there's other very interesting things happening. So now, for example, all the restaurants in, in New York that have been closed because of coronavirus, the issue is to see how you can reconvert some of this in a way to provide food of the people that most need it and get unemployed taxi drivers to actually be paid to deliver that food and there's everywhere i know i can tell you what's going on in rome but i'm sure every single one of you can tell what is changing in your area and i think it's a very interesting time because some of those changes i think are there to stay and are giving us an idea of what a more sustainable food system could be after the crisis is over the first thing reiner and i did is accelerate the planning of our keyhole garden and, and vegetable <laughs> seed buying because we thought this may not be an isolated case um, and also we're accelerating our plants to set up our, our farm indeed and yeah seeing more much many Parisians escape to the countryside like my brother and, I, and I'm wondering I'm hoping he's going to find that it's much nicer here than in Paris <laughs> so uh, I'm curious how much of a, of a transformation also in the rural urban balance might take place and people re remembering uh, that remembrance. You know. Wonderful. Any other final thoughts? And anything to share? I wanted to pick up on yeah. what Paul had shared because I thought it was so beautiful. Um, and what's come to me in, in, in all of this conversation is that obviously we have a huge amount of knowledge between ourselves and how do we not only communicate that, that knowledge but how do we take in the art of listening before we communicate our knowledge mm -hmm. um, and so you know how do we mix how do we balance mm -hmm. what we can add to the conversation to what is already there and it's I'm just putting it out there I don't have an answer because I think it's something that's continuing um, and um, very much 
So, um, so I just wanted that, you know, we all, I think many of us who've had the privilege to work in, in environments which are not our own, and if we have listened, we've found out treasures, absolute treasures. Um, and, and again, it's the issue of the, if we do work with government officials, how do we get them to also listen? And, and that is part of the transformation in our food systems and in our nutrition is that we come in thinking we've got the answer and the solution and whatnot without yeah. often, you know, really listening to the wisdom that is there either from the elders or from whoever else. So, um, thank you. Yeah. I, wanted to say that. I think Darren wanted to say something. Darren, wait, um, um, yeah, go ahead. Am I here? Yeah, yeah. just very quickly. Thank you to everyone. This was a, a lovely hour, but um, in our small group, two, two of us told stories about the impact of our grandmothers and, and how they shared with us their knowledge about food and growing and what to grow and what not to grow. And it was just inspiring to hear. And just the, on, on the last contribution, remembering elders, but also remembering those directly in our lineage, which I'm sure left us with gems. Of, they knew the soil so well, right? And the, and, and this smaller geographical community so well, and, and just paying attention to those gems that they left us with. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Actually, my grandmother was the first thing that came to my mind when Anna invited yeah. me. Uh, her Same. bouillon, pre-Christmas, pre-Christmas uh, mass bouillon, not the <laughs> Christmas meal, the bouillon. <laughs> and Paul, did you want to thank you, Darren? Paul, did yeah, you want to say something? I think uh, to the previous uh, 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 comment, I believe it's your introduction where you, where Narayan can serve, it's going to grow. I think this is this could be kind of the focal point for learning how to listen better. And mm -hmm. at least we have a venue now uh, yeah. and we have a group of committed folks here and this is gonna grow. Because I, I think, uh, as you mentioned, even in your work with FAO, there was you know, institutional issues that it was sometimes rather challenging to discuss these very real issues that yeah. we face. So I think with with, with your initiative now and, and, our, and our community of practice here, uh, we can explore the art of listening and listening yeah. to the earth and listening to our people and how eventually we can start to influence policy and programs because it's yeah. tricky. It's yeah. tricky. Our, our poor folks are under the gun to perform. And so what we're talking about is a little bit uh, different than this uh, prescriptive uh, performance-based uh, approach of the this yeah. one. And I, I saw you, Anna, but just uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, because I, I mean, I'm saying this because I know some people will start um, uh, signing out, but next, the next oh. uh, webinar will be on listening to the earth, actually. This is an initiative that we, we started with Myra and a few amazing folks uh, last June, uh, precisely to say, you know, we won't be able to take those climate actions and so on without that listening to our elders, to the soil, but also to the earth. And so we'll share what that can be concretely. And I'm also another um, theme that I'd like to bring up soon is this, um, we believe there's an unwritten 18th SDG, which we call SDG zero, um, uh, which as David Navarro would say, infuses all the other SDGs and it's one on love and joy. And I think that's also acting, from a space of love acting from a space of joy and how that changes what we do and i think the story of green kana is exactly part of that magic you know these were people who were not just acting with a technical mind but it was a it's a labor of love and we all know that when we do something we love we're just so good <laughs> you know it's often more we're, when we do something we love that's where we usually are good and, and so these are the kind of things that it's also listening to one's heart and being true to oneself and, and focusing where we want to do. So that's just to give a little bit of a appetizer of what next themes will be. And, and actually, I just want to share the gift that life has given me is that um, when opening listening to the earth, we also got the opportunity to move here 
uh, where we can listen to the earth wonderfully and we're going to be creating a, a center where we can hopefully host practical listening yes. sessions <laughs> charlotte yeah charlotte yeah Sorry to, bo to bother again, but there are a couple of people that were talking of the importance of listening and how do we influence governments and policymakers. And I think in my experience, the most effective way of doing that is getting them out of scientific publications, getting them out of fancy reports and out of the offices, taking them to the field, having them meet people, talking with them and in particular not the elders in those communities the indigenous people but also all these uh, institutions that have been working for 20 or more years in those areas that are doing things that you never hear about because they are actually doing it instead of talking about it so i think that's also an important dimension yeah and sorry to have in interrupted <laughs> your conclusion. no worries so we have uh, five last minutes and I'd last maybe Anna, Paul and Dr. Ramakan to say maybe a final word to, to send us off. Um, and before I do that, I'd just like to say that the Listening to the Earth team is every Sunday evening at 9 p.m. CT offering what we're calling a solidarity meditation, healing people and the planet in the time of COVID. Uh, it's uh, live streamed on the Facebook of Listening to the Earth, which is a Facebook page. I'm typing it in the chat now and I can send you all an email. Uh, so we'll be doing that. We started that as an impromptu thing last Sunday. Or we'll be doing that again uh, in the next few weeks as we all go through this global crisis. Um, but yes, Tauna, Anna, Paul, Ramakant, if you'd like to say last few words to conclude. <laughs> Wait, let me unmute you. Anna, got it, go for it, yeah. Yes, I, I propose uh, three key action points. The first one is to practice, now that at home, uh, this art of listening among us in our families and that we brief them about uh, around this, uh, also about this session. That is one point. The other proposal is that in our collective collage, uh, we also collect these observations uh, and what we're listening of changes that are occurring, that are inspiring. And the third element is that uh, we, with these memories we had, that we were cherishing a moment ago, that we bring them, uh, we take them out of uh, just memories and that we revitalize them. And that we added also in the collage of experiences uh, um, that we proposed in the very beginning, if you wish. And thank okay. you. I'm typing this in the chat, everybody, including the email address where you can send your inputs for the collage if you'd like to contribute to that. Great. Paul. Yeah, well, just a few words. Uh, we're all very uh, aware and concerned, of course, about the global virus, but it's really taught us the importance of listening to the earth. I mm -hmm. The virus has, has really shown us the importance of that. And again, to me, you know, mindful breathing throughout the day really puts, puts a, especially me, in a mood of acceptance and, and really seeing and really listening. So it just, uh, just try to remember to breathe mindfully. And uh, I think we'll, we'll all get through things well. <laughs> Thank you for Ramakand. Yeah. The the core belief is joy is the only reality. And it's you who reminded me that today is the day of International Day of Happiness. Yeah. And then I say, <laughs> a little above is joy. And then above that is bliss, ananda. Okay. So all of this pathos, miseries, is illusion is what uh, Sri Ramchandra Patekar said. And then it's our attitude is very important. Partake the food with constant divine remembrance, with gratitude. It's not uh, just thinking with the feeling. That's another thing that uh, we all should uh, uh, practice. That, you know, the, the assimilation is better, the sense of well being, we will feel it when we do that. It's the attitude. That's the last thing that I would like to 
Thank, Thank you. you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. And uh, eating. having to see in fact with all of you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And thanks to your team, Dr. Ramakant, who made the connection yeah, from India yeah. so well. Please show, show us your colleagues. They have to show Robert. And <laughs> you see, we have a whole team yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so staying up so late in yeah. India. <laughs> Um, oh, wonderful. Great. We spanned California to Asia. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you all so much. So, we are learning to, heart, to sow with the heart, to compost with the heart, to harvest with the heart, and to eat with the heart. Great. Happy, very happy International Day of Happiness and a great spring. This is the first day of spring as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Namaste. <laughs>